And now time for questions. So uh, I have one, so I'll just start. Yeah, it. please. So the behavior of temperature with uh, resistivity that you showed, is yeah. it just for any, two, for any dimensional strange metals or uh, particularly to two dimensional? Yeah, it, it, it's harder to find strange metal in three dimensional oh. crystals, but it's true in any dimension, that's right. And, okay. and that's another reason why we, this local incoherence model is believed to be, I think, the most likely explanation, because uh, that's the only way you can, I can see coming up with a dimensional independent result. Um, okay. Other theories that we played with don't, don't have that feature. Okay, thank yeah. you. Questions? Hello, sir. Yes. So you talked about uh, electrons losing their entanglement property at a particular temperature or something? There and hang. Okay, go ahead. Yes. I'm yes. So if if we uh, if that temperature uh, is uh, like if well, then what happens in a uh, H two orbital? Like, will they have uh, if they lose their entanglement, then won't uh, the well, Pauli exclusion principle be in trouble? So in an H two molecule, uh, mm -hmm. you know that's a stable object. It, uh, the, the binding energy, I forget. I mean, it's probably on the order of an electron volt. And a useful number to remember is an electron volt is, uh, what, 11,000 degrees Kelvin? No, or 100,000 degrees Kelvin, I think. Uh, so unless you're really a very high temperature, you, there's very little chance of a, of a hydrogen molecule actually dissociating into, into atoms. It's very tightly bound. Uh, so it, uh, of course, if the, they can be chemical reactions, uh, yeah, so those two electrons are entangled, and then uh, eventually they can separate, and the, that electron can entangle with something else, and entangled can become uh, a many body uh, feature. Uh, so that's just understanding how entanglement goes from two to many is a very difficult. Uh, if, uh, if we suppose topic. there is just one orbital and two electrons. Like oh, you mean they're like this? Yeah. Then will will there be a yeah? That's, when that's they you could say that's entanglement, but not really. There, it's just both electrons. One is up and one is down, and uh, yeah, that's a kind of question of taste. But I don't think we say that that those two electrons are entangled. You need you really need to have them in two different states, two okay. spatially separated states. I think. Thank you. Hi, uh, so what prevents a single electron from moving in the SYK model? Oh, nothing. <laughs> we just declared <laughs> we're going to <laughs> look at that. Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, this is why this problem wasn't solved uh, 25 years ago. Uh, yeah, so the natural, uh, natural assumption, as you said, is to allow electrons to move on their own, uh, and then somehow they lose the ability to move coherently. That's, that's been the dominant paradigm uh, in, uh, uh, in studies of strange metal, which has led not to much success at all. Uh, so we were just studying, we just say, okay, let's imagine they couldn't. <laughs> uh, and we came up with this model. So, but I think an open question in the field is how do we go from you know, that crystal structure that I showed you? Can, 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 so the challenge uh, you could rightly place before me Here's the material, here's the chemical composition. Is it going to be a strange metal? Uh, we don't know how to answer that question. So there's some process of renormalization. So what's, I think the point is that in, in ordinary metals, the electron acquired a cloud of all this dust around it. And the dust didn't do very much. It still allowed it to move. So here, because of the interaction somehow, which is a way we don't fully understand, uh, it's acquiring the dust, but the dust is not, uh, doesn't leave the electron uh, able, to, able to move on its own. It just becomes incoherent. So the model I showed you uh, is, a, is, a, you know, is a great simplification. What it does is it separates the two things. It, on each little circle, it makes the electrons entangled, and then you allow it to move. So once you separate them, we can solve it. <laughs> But in real world, both happen at the same time. And exactly uh, how that happens, that's exactly what uh, you know, I'm working on. That's, that is a very interesting question. <laughs> uh, Tripartite entanglement and multipartite entanglement. You mean uh, multiparticle like moves? GHZ states, where three uh, objects are entangled, uh, three particles. Those on, yes, uh, you can put those terms in. Uh, okay. I'm 
reinterpreting, I think, what you said, but you can certainly put in three particle moves and four particle yeah. moves. Uh, turns out they don't change the basic physics. Mm -hmm. It remains the same. So uh, what's important is the, is the smallest number of uh, states. The, those dominate at low energies. Hello, sir. Yes, hi. Sir, as we know that the entanglement of the two electron or atom is directly related to the quantum information processing or the quantum information processing between the two. Yes, atoms. sure. And uh, you related the, this quantum information or entanglement by the superconductor. Uh, yeah. Then this is possible that the uh, current also can be sent as the information by the entanglement. Okay, so your question is how can I use this entanglement to do quantum computing, for example. Can I control this? And, uh, well, uh, yeah, so I think the big difference between what I'm working on and what somebody in quantum computing and quantum information was working on, uh, I just look at the entanglement that's given to me. Nature picks out certain entanglement. I'm trying to understand it. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, I just have, all I know is about, I have a generic system and it's still entangled on its own. And entangles in a rather complicated way, and I, I can't really control it very well. I'm just trying to understand what it is. Whereas in quantum information, uh, we assume to, to be all powerful, where we can control exactly what's entangled what in, uh, with who at, at every step in time. And that's an exceedingly difficult process, which is why quantum computers, I think, are highly improbable. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a much harder thing. Uh, we, so we're not, we're so far from now understanding how to control and, uh, but maybe there's some way you can use this. As, you know, I think many people are want to a middle path where you want to take nature's entanglement, but then perturb it a little bit to do something useful. Uh, so we'll see. <laughs> that may be easier. <laughs> well, uh, can you please uh, put more light on? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, the quantum matter without quasi particles. Yes, like, uh, yes. Can you classify like quantum matter with quasi particles? And uh, well, that's certainly one classification. Oh. Uh, I, it, you know, we have very few models that we understand without quasi particles, and there's certainly several examples. I mean, SYK is the simplest one of them. And there's others uh, which have Fermi surfaces coupled to gauge fields, and how these are connected. I think we're still uh, trying to understand. Uh, certainly the SYK model has randomness in it. It's called random coupling. So it's, it's in a disordered system, which is kind of realistic too. Uh, but if you have no disorder, then the strange metals seem to be rather different. So, okay. Uh, I think those are really the only two examples where you have uh, emergent gauge fields or you have this kind of thing, which is related to emergent gravity. Uh, now, with quasi-particles, well, uh, you know as well as I do, <laughs> there's textbooks written on insulators, metals, superconductors, magnets, uh, and they're all basically understood by some variant of density functional theory or something like that. Uh, they're all pretty much the same from my perspective, but anyway. <laughs> That's a lot of solid state physics, okay. though, and a lot of interesting things. Uh, everything in, uh, in your iPhone depends upon systems with quasi-particles. Uh, maybe someday we'll have a material that doesn't have quasi-particle in the iPhone. That's my dream. <laughs> the model that you defined is defined on a random, looks like defined on a random graph. Yes. Yeah. So how do you define the dimension? You mentioned some time yeah. that it was dimension uh, two. But right, right. So that was just a, interview. I put that on two just for convenience. Uh, the, the basic properties I was talking about are at very low energy scale where that point, that, that two-dimensional blob just shrinks to a point, effectively. So it's, it's uh, you're basically only looking at the zero momentum mode, if you wish. So the D and D plus one that you mentioned are zero and... Yeah, so, so really the f fundamental correspondence then is between the SYK model, which is in zero plus one dimensions, and gravity, which is in one plus one dimension. Now it turns out that both the SYK model and the, and the gravity in one plus one, are, it's, they're hard to define if you just take them in two dimensions. It's easier to embed them in some other finite dimensional space. Uh, that allows you to control the theory a little bit better. Uh, so it's a convenience. <laughs> uh, hello, sir. Oh. 
I'd yes. like to congratulate on the wonderful talk you gave today. Oh, yes. thank you. I can't see you. Oh, there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, in certain systems, uh, we see a metal to insulate a transition. Yeah. So, you expect, do you expect to see certain signatures of strange metal during this transition takes place? Yeah, it's possible, right? I mean, there are these organic crystals uh, where you have a metal insulated transition and there seems to be some strange metal behavior near the critical point. So, so one place strange metals often appear are near quantum phase transitions, which is how I first started thinking about them. Uh, it's, in the cuprates, it's not, uh, it's not a metal insulated transition, but it's something related where you get this strange metal. Would, yeah. that, would that regime be very small to be detected experimentally? Uh, no, because you have this, even though the transition is 1.0 temperature, at finite temperature it, it broadens out into a bigger window. Uh, because roughly speaking at finite temperature, the higher your temperature, strangely enough, the harder it is to tell the difference between a metal and a semi and an insulator. Mm -hmm. So it becomes the regime over which you see the strange metal in between becomes easier at somewhat higher temperatures. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Well, yeah. I have another Sorry. question. Yes. So uh, the question is, uh, if you are superconductor, you apply magnetic field, and the superconductor will destroy. You destroy the copper pairs. Yes. The same it should does to this strange metal correlations for the entanglement, or scaling down and destroy. Or what yeah. is the process? Yeah. So that's an excellent question. I mean, people are, are looking at strange metal at, at lower temperatures as you apply a magnetic field, and yes, indeed, on you do see the, the same behavior down to very, very low temperatures, even below TC once you put a magnetic field. And I didn't show that picture. Yeah. But strange yeah. metal kills, uh, the correlations length should obey the similar like breaking the copper pairs. Uh, no, I don't think we really understand that yet. Uh, who knows? I mean, once you apply a magnetic field, the copper pairs are gone. And the electrons have become part of this. Uh, there are no Kupu pairs left, so I don't think there's any memory of the Kupu pairs once you're in the strange metal. Okay. Yeah. And what the dramatical, uh, dramatical uh, fact happened that one is zero resistive and suddenly in strange metal is highly resistive? That is the question of the day, right? That's exactly what we want to understand. Yeah, I don't know the answer. Well, we have some guesses, but uh, you know, one thing at a time. <laughs> We're slow in condensed matter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sir, thank you. So, in spite of the high resistivity, what sends the strange metal still a metal? Ah, so that's the question is why, in spite of the high resistivity, why I'm calling it a metal, uh, as opposed to an insulator, for example. So, this has to do with the fact that the resistance increases as you heat the temperature. So, if you have a metal, it has these electrons that move freely. When you heat it up, you get more and more electrons moving around, and they start to collide with each other, and the resistance goes up. So if I take a metal and I heat it up, the resistance goes up. This is true for copper or gold or anything. But if I take an insulator like diamond or silicon, pure silicon, if I am at zero temperature and I try to drive some current, no current drive is driven. It's just sitting there. It's got all the electrons are trapped. But if I heat it up, you get, you get a few electrons that are excited uh, out of the uh, ground state. Uh, and then those guys can move around. And so for an for a insulator, if you heat it up, the resistance goes down. So we have this very strange, that's an excellent question, we have this very strange object here, which has a resistance that looks like an insulator, but it keeps getting more and more resistive as you heat it up. So that's why it's strange. <laughs> so this uh, model that you talked about, you can get the electrons going like this. Yeah. Ah, so the question is, how does this um, SYK model of a entangled metal reconcile with the BCS theory? So the BCS theory for the uninitiated uh, is the basic theory of superconductivity uh, in ordinary metals, like aluminum, uh, which becomes superconducting at some low temperature. Uh, and what happens in the theory, that the electrons pair up and form a Cooper pair, and that pair undergoes both condensation uh, to become a superconductor. So that's the basic theory of superconductivity. Uh, and so the question is, how, how would this strange metal go superconducting? Uh, so the short answer is I don't know. I mean, that's very much, now that we have a model of a strange metal, we can start thinking about pairing, and people are doing that actively as we speak, I'm sure. I have one student working on exactly that problem. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, 
uh, we still have to many other things, we were try easier things we're trying to do with this model before we worry about the formation of the superconducting state. If you take a small perturbation, yeah. like a gravitational perturbation or something, then you have a black hole being formed, so mm -hmm. EDS is unstable. Yeah. And the time scale for formation of the black hole is like one by square of the amplitude of the perturbation. Yeah. And the uh, black holes, you know, sorry, the, the size of the black hole, the mass of the black hole is also dependent on the size of the perturbation. Right. So, so there might be some relation. There, like there may be some analogs in strange metal. I, I don't think we understand that well at all. So all of the processes you're talking about are far out of equilibrium. I've, I deliberately focused on the very last stage, which is just near equilibrium, because that's, uh, in a way, the, it's the easiest thing to understand, at least for the strange metal and also for the black hole. Uh, uh, so H bar over, this turns out this time, H bar divided by temperature is a very universal property of black holes. You take any black hole in, uh, in any space time of any shape, uh, that's the time uh, at which it equilibrates. Uh, but for other properties, you can't just take any black hole you want. There's a particular set of black holes that look like the strange metal. Uh, sir. Yes. 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 Sir, uh, isn't the uh, idea of entanglement usually uh, observed in uh, low temperature uh, materials? Like here, uh, when we are yeah. considering strange metals, that was yes. around 100 Kelvin. Right. But uh, you uh, applied the idea of entanglement uh, to the system. Is like a... Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Why is entanglement something that we are talking about at finite temperature? Uh, well, uh, yeah, entanglement can be present at really all energy scales. Uh, it's, it's just a question of uh, can we see its effects? Uh, so that's one answer. The other answer, these, these time scales, these temperatures we're talking about are actually quite low on the scale of the natural scale for the electrons. So the electron, the natural scale at which electrons lose their quantum of nature is about 100,000 Kelvin. So if you're talking about temperatures about 100 to 200 Kelvin, it's actually a very low temperature. Even room temperature for these electrons uh, is, is, is low. And uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why quantum mechanics is so important in the theory of metals. Uh, the natural scales are much higher. So, okay. Okay, I think it's getting quite late, so I think this is a good time to say thank you very much to Subir for this. For this awesome lecture, thank you all for coming and see you next year at the 5th Homi Bhava lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>